Welcome back everyone for one more example about area between the curve. Uh, on this example, we're going to take two functions, two curves again. Uh, we're going to take y equals x squared minus 2x, a parabola, and y equals x, just a standard line. And we'll find the area of the region between the goalpost x equals 0 and x equals 4. Now you can see in the illustration here that um, if we take the green line to be x, y equals x, and then the yellow curve is our parabola, y equals x squared minus 2x here. Um, if we look at the goalpost, x equals 0 is the origin over here, where they both intersect, notice that. And x equals 4 is actually over here. Um, in this situation, the, the bounds are given to us specifically 0 to 4. But somewhere in the middle, the two functions cross each other and actually uh, the bigger function gets swapped, right? The, the line, the green function is on top first from zero to this intersection, the parabola is below it, and then they switch roles. Uh, so the thing is, if we look at this, if we call the, the green function, we'll call this f of x, and if we call the parabola g of x, uh, we have somewhat of a problem here that if we take the integral from zero to four, Four. if we take f of x minus g of x here and integrate this, you're going to end up with some positive region uh, plus some negative region, and these things are going to cancel out. Not entirely necessarily, but there's going to be, this is actually only going to give us the net area of the, of the region we see here, not necessarily the total area. And that's because as you switch roles, this region over here is considered negative in terms of area, and this region here would be considered positive. And switching the roles of f and g isn't going to really fix it either. Uh, the fix that we need, uh, get rid of this here, is we want to make sure both regions are considered positive area. The fix we need to have is we need to make sure we're taking the absolute value of these things. And so what that's going to do for us is essentially the following. We need to find this point of intersection. Where do the functions cross? And we saw how to do this previously, right? Uh, we need to take f of x and set it equal to g of x. And so we need f of x, we decide to be x, and g of x is x squared minus 2x. If we solve this quadratic equation, let's minus x from both sides, we end up with x squared minus 3x equals 0. A simple factorization gives us x times x minus 3 equals 0. Our points of intersection are going to be x equals 0, which we saw earlier. Uh, with the origin, and x equals 3. Uh, and that's maybe not too surprising. We can see right here, we get the point 3 comma 3 uh, for our the two functions. So we get this point of intersection. Uh, we had the origin as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have to treat this as a piecewise function. Because integrating with absolute value can be somewhat of a challenge if the function switches its sign inside of the domain, like it does here from 0 to 4. So what we're going to do is we're going to break up the integral into two pieces, right? Uh, what I mean is we want to integrate from 0 to 4 of the absolute value of f minus g dx. We're going to break it up into two pieces. We're going to go from 0 to 3, take the absolute value of f minus g dx, and then we're going to add this to the integral from 3 to 4, the absolute value of f minus g dx here. Uh, because a property of integration that we know about is that if you pick any intermediate value between a and b, you can break up the integral into two pieces where you integrate from zero to the, to the middle and then from the middle to the end, if so you have to do that. And the reason we want to do that in this situation is that the way we've chosen f minus g is that g is the, uh, g is the parabola and f was the line there. As we can still see from the picture above, the f minus g is going to be positive entirely from zero to three. And so we can actually drop the absolute value because we know that function is going to be entirely positive, f minus g, because on that interval, f is always bigger than g. But on the second interval, right, uh, because f is now going to be smaller than g, we know the area here is going to be negative. And so we can be proactive about that. If we drop the absolute value sign, we just know there's going to be a negative sign there as we integrate from 3 to 4 here um, of f minus g like so. Uh, we know that the integral, uh, we know that it's going to give us a negative area like so. And so we have the same function, different bounds. We do have to be careful about the bounds. The bounds are different, but the function we're dealing with here, f minus g, is going to be the exact same. 
uh, with both situations. So even though we're doing two integrals, it's not exactly reinventing the wheel when we do the second one. So plugging in f minus g, remember, remember f was the function y equals x. Uh, so we end up with just an x right here, minus the second part, which g of x was x squared minus 2x. Make sure you subtract the entire thing. Like so, we subtract the 3 to 4. Uh, and then when you combine the like terms, I'm going to kind of get ahead of myself here. We're going to combine some like terms. We're going to get a 3x minus x squared as the function we're going to integrate here. Uh, notice what happened as we distribute the negative sign here. So then you get a double negative of 2x plus x, giving us the 3x right there. And if you don't like this negative sign uh, in front of the second integral, you can always make it a positive by swapping the roles of the bounds three and four. Uh, you can do that. Um, either approach is perfectly fine. I don't have a strong preference one way or the other personally, but you can do whatever you want there. So we want to integrate the function 3x minus x squared. Uh, the antiderivative would then give us 3 halves x squared minus x cubed over 3, plugged in the boundaries 3 to 0, 3. I'm going to leave the minus sign the way it was. We're going to get the exact same antiderivative, 3x squared minus x cubed over 3. And as anti-differentiation is one of the hardest parts about uh, calculating integrals, it's nice that we don't have to calculate uh, the antiderivative twice. Be aware that this thing is going to be subtracted right here. Uh, like so. And so plug all these numbers in here. Uh, we'll, we'll do the first one, plug in the three. We end up with three times nine over two minus three cubed over three. We'll come back to that one. You're going to subtract from it, plug in zero. I love that one. You're just going to get zero minus zero, which everything could be that simple, right? Uh, this will give us the first group, the first integral that we calculate. We're going to leave that one right here. And then we're going to remember to subtract the second one, in which case now we're going to plug in 4. We get 3 times 16, 4 squared over 2, minus uh, 4 cubed over 3, like so. And then bring in one other term. We're going to minus, if we plug in 3, 3 times 9 over 2, minus 3 cubed over 3, is it? That's right. And then this represents the second one right here. Now, I want you to be very cautious uh, because we see this term right here. We see this term right here. Even though we haven't simplified it yet, we know they're identical. Um, and we see this subtraction, right? So we're tempted like, oh, they'll just cancel out, right? Because you subtract them. But JK there, uh, there's a subtraction. There's also a subtraction. This is a double negative. These things are actually going to combine together into one right? Uh, much like the, the, the lions of Voltron, they're going to combine to even a larger value than we would have, might have anticipated in the first place. So I'm actually going to combine those things together and just slap a 2 in front of them, right? Uh, we end up with 3 times 9, which is 27, 27 over 2. And then we're going to get 3 cubed is again 27, but if you divide that by 3, you're going to get a 9 right there. So we're going to get two of those things. Um, the zeros from the first group, they're just gone entirely because subtracting zero is not going to do much. So then we're left with subtracting uh, what we have right here. Uh, two goes into 16 eight times. Three times eight is going to be 24. So we get a negative 24. And then, uh, again, distribute this negative sign to these. So we're going to get a plus... Uh, 4 cubed is a 64 over 3. Uh, so kind of stuck with that fraction for right now. Um, if you don't want the fractions too much, you can distribute at least the 2 right here. 27 halves times 2, of course, will just give us 27. Uh, so we get 27. 9 times 2 is 18. We get minus 24 and 64 thirds. I'm going to procrastinate the fraction until the very end if I can avoid it. 27 take away 18 would give us 9. And then we have another... Uh, 24 to take away from that, it would appear, <laughs> right? Um, and so that ends up with a negative uh, 15 plus 64 fifths, thirds, excuse me. And so it looks like the we can't, there, there's nothing that can cancel out with the 60, the 64 thirds other than we just got to write this as a common denominator, right? So we could times top and bottom of the 15 
three over three there. Uh, so that'll give us a negative 45 over three plus 64 over three. And that gives us a 19 thirds in the end. All right. And so this gives us the area under the curve. Now, this is the area of the entire region. This is going back to the very top of this thing here. We get the area of both this positive region and this region, which is we had to switch it from uh, a negative to a positive. That's why we broke up this thing at this value three. So for these areas between the curves, these are some of the most challenging parts here. Uh, and we saw examples like this similar to in calculus one, where we wanted to find the area under a curve, not necessarily between two curves. But if we wanted to find the geometric area, the total area, uh, we have to kind of treat the area below the x-axis as positive. Um, in this situation, we're trying to treat this area as positive this here as well. And we also see examples in science where this is an appropriate thing to do sometimes and sometimes it's not. Um, if, we, if we think of this, this situation as a position, a motion type problem, are we interested in the total distance traveled by a particle in some time limit? Or are we looking at just the displacement, the net distance changed, right? And the two are very different questions, but also very related to each other. And so this example demonstrates if we're interested in the total distance traveled, we have to keep track of signs and make sure we take absolute values. Um, but if we're only interested in the net the net distance, then we would treat this as negative and this is positive. So the definite integral has this net area built into it, but it can be modified into total area if we need it to be. Uh, so thanks for watching our videos here about area between the curve. Uh, stay tuned for our next videos about a volume using integrals to calculate volumes. And I'll see you then. Bye everyone.